Okay, we are all set for our second keynote uh, address. We're close enough to the beginning. We actually could call this the second opening keynote address. And uh, last year at our annual conference, we were pleased to have Federal Trade Commission Chairman Joe Simons as a keynoter. And this year, I'm pleased and honored that Christine Wilson is with us. Christine Wilson was sworn in September 2018 as a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission to a term that expires in September 2025. Commissioner Wilson previously served at the FTC as Chairman Tim Uris's chief of staff during the George W. Bush administration. And in between her periods of service at the FTC, she practiced competition and consumer protection law at law firms and as in-house counsel. At the time she was nominated, Commissioner Wilson was serving as Senior Vice President, Legal, Regulatory, and International for Delta Airlines. I bet you're probably thinking about now it's a good time not to be in that position at the, at, at the airlines. Uh, I think there's going to be much profit sharing this year. Right. If you didn't hear that, Commissioner Wilson said she's not sure there's going to be much profit sharing this year at the, at the airlines. Uh, prior to joining Delta, uh, Christine Wilson was a member of the Washington, D.C. antitrust practice uh, at Kirkland and Ellis and at O'Melveny and Myers. Uh, She's a graduate of Georgetown University Law Center and the University of Florida. We're honored to have Commissioner Wilson with us, uh, and please join me in welcoming her. Good morning. It is good to be here. How's everybody doing? Good. Exciting times, huh? A lot of reasons. <laughs> it's good to be here, though. I, I am actually delighted to be here for this event. When I received the invitation, Alden Abbott said, you must say yes. And I said, yes, sir, good. because we all say yes to the general counsel. So, so but, but then I began to learn more about the organization. I hadn't crossed paths with it before, and I am thrilled at the mission of your organization and delighted to be here and to share in, in this dialogue today. Obviously, the, the topic of this year's confer uh, conference, the Broadband Beyond 2020 Competition, Freedom, and Privacy is timely, but, but of course, the issues of competition and freedom and privacy are of perennial importance. In October 2019, I gave a talk in Brazil on free enterprise, free markets, and free people, and the interconnectedness of those concepts. Under President Bolsonaro, Brazil is throwing off its yoke of socialism and rapidly privatizing and deregulating its economy. The trend is welcomed not only by the Brazilian citizens, but also by small business owners who in Brazil now have the freedom to set their own hours of operation and establish their own prices. What a novel concept. It's a good thing, it's a good thing. But these developments abroad contrast starkly with the trends that we're facing here at home. 43% of our population supports or professes to support the notion of socialism. And one of the front runners for presidency in the Democrat party is a Democrat socialist. And so, we have some competing trends here about how to organize our economy, and these issues are, are incredibly timely. Spoiler alert, I am passionate about free markets and competition. I applaud SFS mission to promote an understanding of free market, limited government, and rule of law principles, and to advocate laws and policies that are true to these principles. So to echo this theme, I'll begin by discussing the benefits of free markets, competition, and deregulation. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but hopefully I'll have a bit of a, a novel take on the issue. Next, I'll discuss the restoration of the FTC's jurisdiction over broadband so that competition laws and not regulations now appropriately provide the primary safeguards for consumers. And finally, 
I'll turn to privacy and discuss the market imperfections and other imperatives that I believe drive the need for federal privacy legislation. Before I begin, I offer the usual disclaimer. The words um, and the views that I express today are my own, not those of the FTC or any other commissioner. So let's start with the benefits of free markets. Ever since I traveled behind the Iron Curtain in 1984, uh, I was 14 years old, I was there for three weeks in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, and, and I saw the misery and the deprivation imposed by command and control economies, I have been an avid proponent of free markets. Market forces ensure that resources are allocated to their highest valued uses and they create the greatest benefits for consumers. Government intervention, in contrast, causes distortions of market forces that create inefficiencies. Ironically, regulatory regimes that are designed to protect consumers end up typically harming them. So two examples from our nation's history illustrate the danger. Begun with the very best of intentions, extensive regulation of railroads and airlines, inhibited innovation, protected rivals at the expense of inefficient competitors, and kept prices high. It's worth walking down memory lane at a time when proponents of elaborate regulatory regimes from big tech to healthcare and beyond abound. As George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So first, railroads. To address concerns of dissatisfied shippers, Congress created the Interstate Commerce Commission and required railroads to charge rates that were, quote, reasonable and just. As new forms of transportation, like trucking and barges, began to compete with railroads, Congress granted the ICC the authority to regulate them as well. In the 1950s and 60s, the railroads designed new train cars that reduced operating costs significantly. So the railroads sought to reduce their prices to reflect their lower costs, but they had to petition the ICC for approval. In several famous cases, the ICC denied the requests of the railroads to lower their prices. Why? To protect a competing but less efficient form of transportation, barges. And so the outcome obviously is ironic because the ICC was originally created to protect consumers, not inefficient competitors. Airline regulation is much the same. In 1938, Congress created the Civil Aeronautics Board. Like the ICC, the CAB was directed to place other, quote, public interest values ahead of competition. For instance, once one airline served a route, the CAB typically refused to allow other airlines to fly that route, claiming competition wasn't necessary. Even when the CAB allowed multiple airlines to compete on the same route, it rarely allowed the carriers to cut prices. So high prices depressed demand and planes frequently flew at less than 60% full. So consequences for consumers are even more dire when government pushes business out of the marketplace entirely. Consider comparator countries in which one country has replaced free markets with command and control. As of the year 2000, the average life expectancies of men and women in South Korea were 8.1 years and 11.2 years longer than for men and women, respectively, in North Korea. Similarly, even 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, people in the former East Germany are earn 86% of the after-tax income of their West German counterparts. And East German per capita GDP is 75% of West German per capita GDP. So against this backdrop, it becomes clear that limited government intervention in, in the market creates significant benefits for consumers. And for this reason, I strongly support President Trump's deregulatory agenda. In particular, I applaud his executive order requiring that for every new regulation created, two must be eliminated. This reform has helped significantly slow the growth of new federal regulations. In fact, one recent study conducted by Susan Dudley shows the federal government under President Trump is issuing roughly half as many new regulations as it did under President Obama. And the FTC has contributed to this laudable trend. In recent years, the FTC has rescinded several rules and guides 
and has updated others to address evolving market dynamics. But the commission can and should do more. In my short time as a commissioner, several of my dissents have highlighted either misguided attempts to expand regulatory constraints or missed opportunities to roll back needlessly prescriptive obligations. I will continue to encourage the FTC and the commission to actively pursue a deregulatory agenda. Consistent with my dim view of regulations, I applaud the repeal of the Open Internet Order and passage of the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. If you examine the consequences of dissolving the restrictive ICC and CAB regimes, you get a great sense for the benefits of eliminating net neutrality. When railroads were significantly deregulated in the late 1970s, they paired unproductive routes and they reduced labor costs. Rail rates fell across the board, particularly for bulk commodities like lumber and coal that could be moved more effectively using methods that the ICC and the regulatory restrictions had previously discouraged. And a similar result arose for the CAB and the airline industry. With the passage of the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978, the CAB ceased to exist. The result, ticket prices fell and output increased significantly. By 1990, economists estimated that airline deregulation increased consumer surplus by roughly $20 billion annually in 2019 dollars. $20 billion annually. And the repeal of net neutrality has already proven to be a boon for businesses and consumers, as I'm sure you'll hear more later today. After falling in 2015 and 2016, the FCC reports that broadband investment increased by $1.5 billion in 2017 and $3 billion in 2018. Since the FCC adopted the Restoring Internet Freedom Order in December 2017, mobile internet speeds have increased 51% and fixed broadband is up 70%. And internet providers built over 450,000 route miles of fiber in 2019. It's a new annual record and it's enough to wrap around the earth 18 times. There is no question that consumers have benefited from the repeal of this heavy-handed regulatory regime. So they're not here now, but if you would please give my congratulations and kudos to Chairman Pai and Commissioners O'Reilly and Carr when they are here later today, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> so let's talk about how we're dealing with broadband now. The repeal of the open internet order returned to the FTC jurisdiction over broadband services. The FTC does not have authority over common carriers, but the Ninth Circuit recently confirmed that common carriers are subject to FTC authority for non-common carrier activities. This decision, in conjunction with the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, confirms the FTC has authority to protect consumers when internet service providers offer non-common carrier services like cable and video. Before the open internet order, the FTC used its authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act to investigate and bring enforcement actions against ISPs and other entities, both for anti-competitive conduct and for unfair or deceptive practices. Now that the open internet order has been repealed, the FTC is once again on the beat and looking for conduct that harms consumers in this area. The replacement of the FCC's extensive regulatory framework with the FTC's broad and flexible Section 5 principles will protect consumers while also facilitating even more investment and innovation. Section 5 of the FTC Act prohibits unfair methods of competition, and it's roughly coterminous with the Sherman Act, our country's primary antitrust law. This provision enables the FTC to address categories of anti-competitive conduct that have concerned advocates of net neutrality. Although the agency has not yet challenged ISPs regarding these practices, it has sued companies for foreclosing rival content in an exclusionary manner. It has also challenged anti-competitive access, discrimination, pricing, and bundling practices. 
and we routinely investigate whether vertical mergers will foreclose competition in upstream or downstream markets and impose obligations to maintain post-merger competition where appropriate. Notably, the FTC is actively strengthening its existing expertise in broadband and technology markets. As you may have heard, we recently created the Technology Enforcement Division. This group is comprised of antitrust attorneys and technologists who monitor technology markets, including the internet ecosystem. As you can imagine, the team is incredibly busy. Section 5 of the FTC Act also prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Using this consumer protection authority, the FTC has addressed a variety of unlawful practices undertaken by ISPs. Let me give you a couple of examples. First, the FTC recently settled charges alleging that AT&T promised consumers unlimited data, but then throttled speeds by up to 90%. AT&T agreed to pay $60 million in consumer redress. TrackPhone settled a similar FTC suit for $40 million in consumer redress. We've brought cases against Time Warner and Sprint for violations of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, garnering $5 million in civil penalties. And we're studying internet broadband providers and related entities to examine how they collect, retain, use, and disclose information about consumers and their devices. When the open internet order was repealed, many were concerned that competition and consumers would suffer. You may recall there were also dire predictions of near apocalyptic proportions that, needless to say, have not come to pass. I can assure you the FTC is closely monitoring this arena and will not hesitate to investigate and bring law enforcement actions where appropriate. So let's turn now to privacy legislation. You may have noticed I am a proponent of free markets, but I also recognize that markets don't always function perfectly. Markets may be inefficient when consumers lack information about key characteristics of goods and services, in other words, when information asymmetries exist. And markets may also be inefficient when costs and benefits of a product are not fully borne by its producers and consumers. In other words, what economists call externalities. Both of these shortcomings exist in privacy and data security. Both information asymmetries and the presence of externalities lead to inefficient outcomes with regard to privacy and data security. So even though I have great faith in markets, I believe federal privacy and data, secur data security legislation is necessary. In the interest of time, I'll focus on privacy. Companies have relatively complete information about the characteristics of the goods and services they offer. Competitive markets drive sellers to provide truthful information to consumers, and competition pushes companies to fulfill <clears throat> Excuse me. To fulfill their promises to consumers about price, quality, and other material terms, dissatisfied buyers are free to vote with their feet. Absent perfect information, though, consumers cannot accurately assess the quality and value of those offerings. Numerous studies have analyzed information asymmetries with regard to privacy, and these studies reveal clearly that consumers do not understand how their data are collected, maintained, and used. As demonstrated by the FTC's privacy cases, some of these practices cause harm. The concept of privacy resignation, the notion that consumers rationally choose to forego expending significant time and effort protecting personal information, also drives the need for legislation. As we all know, it's incredibly cumbersome to manage online personal data options and frequent data breaches further resign consumers to a lack of privacy. In the face of these documented market failures, government intervention through the form of privacy legislation may help protect consumers. And a privacy law can also provide needed transparency so consumers can make informed choices. So information asymmetry is one reason for privacy legislation, but there are others, including predictability and guidance for businesses. Domestically, businesses need clarity and certainty regarding privacy rules of the road. 
As I'm sure you're aware, CCPA became effective in January and other states are seeking to pass their own privacy laws. The result? A patchwork of laws that will impose burdensome compliance costs and constrain interoperability, undercutting the ability of US companies to compete globally. Federal privacy legislation could help avoid this unnecessary burden on businesses while simultaneously providing appropriate protections for consumers. And privacy legislation can also address the emerging gaps in sector-specific approaches to privacy laws created by evolving technologies. For example, HIPAA applies to doctor's offices and hospitals, but not to wearables or to websites like WebMD. Sensitive medical information is no longer housed primarily in doctor's offices. Your phone and your watch collect information about your blood sugar, your exercise habits, and your heart health. Because data is ubiquitous, we need a comprehensive federal privacy law. Internationally, GDPR came into effect in May 2018. While some countries are emulating the GDPR approach, others are striking out on their own. The growing number of diverging privacy regimes will create incremental hurdles to efficient cross-border data flows. Consistency among regulatory frameworks reduces company costs, promotes international competitiveness, and increases compliance. So a comprehensive US privacy law that enacts a single privacy standard for the US could facilitate global interoperability, helping to bridge the differences between US and foreign privacy regimes. Having discussed why a free marketeer like me supports federal privacy legislation, I'd like to highlight in my remaining time certain principles and elements that should be included in a privacy law. Most notably, I believe that privacy legislation should incorporate the United States traditional harm-focused, risk-based approach to privacy protections. From the FTC cases, we know cognizable harms include physical injury, financial injury, reputational injury, and unwanted intrusion. Another area of mainstream consensus involves accountability. Legislation should require accountability for both privacy and data security practices for entities that handle data. Another worthy principle, privacy legislation should embrace the notion that transparency empowers individuals to make informed choices. The legislative framework should also consider competition. Regulations, by their very nature, impact market dynamics. For regulations to succeed in restoring market forces, they must eliminate market failures using the narrowest possible approach. We should avoid the pitfalls of GDPR, which decreased venture capital investment and entrenched dominant players in the digital advertising market. We need privacy legislation that provides appropriate protections for consumers while maintaining competition and fostering innovation. In addition to these high-level principles, I'd recommend that privacy legislation include a few specific elements. First, the FTC, with its decades of experience in bringing privacy and data security cases, should be the enforcing agency. Second, any legislation should include civil monetary penalties, which Congress has included in other statutes enforced by the FTC, like COPPA. Third, the FTC should have jurisdiction over nonprofits and common carriers, which collect huge volumes of sensitive information. Fourth, any law should include targeted APA rulemaking authority so the FTC can make adjustments in response to technological developments. No worries. That I, I recognize my voice. <laughs> Fifth, uh, preemption will be key to precluding a patchwork of conflicting state laws that will unnecessarily burden businesses and hinder data flows. And I'll end the list with something that a privacy law should not include, a private right of action, which would allow plaintiff's lawyers rather than expert agencies like the FTC to establish a sound and consistent national policy. So in conclusion, thanks again to the Free State Foundation for inviting me here today to share my thoughts on these issues. As I noted at the outset, the topics of competition, freedom, and privacy are of perennial importance. I commend the SFF for its research and education efforts to support free market principles. Government-controlled markets 
create toxic outcomes for consumers. Every experience that we've had in the 20th and 21st centuries reinforces that notion. Today, we face an onslaught of big government proposals. We must fight each day to defend our free markets, our system of free enterprise, and ultimately, our individual freedoms. In the words of President Thomas Jefferson, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. So I encourage you to be vigilant with me. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson, thank you so much for those remarks. I think uh, before you joined us this morning during my welcome, I uh, said to the group, as I do each year, uh, that at the Free State Foundation, we're unabashed in proclaiming our uh, free market principles, and uh, certainly your uh, speech was in that vein, and your uh, devotion to those principles is appreciated very, very much in your service. So what we're going to do now, uh, we have uh, up on the dais with Commissioner Wilson, two of the Free State Foundation's uh, members of the, our board of academic advisors. We've got a prestigious group of academic advisors, and these two are certainly among them. Ted Bolema uh, and uh, Tim Brennan. What I'm going to do, well, let me give you their titles. We've got the full bio. Uh, their whole life story is in the brochure, but, but their uh, official titles are uh, Ted is Executive Director, Institute for the Study of Economic Growth, Department of Economics at Wichita State University. And uh, Tim Brennan, of course, is a professor of public policy and economics at the University of Maryland. And again, they're both members of the uh, Board of Academic Advisors here at FSF. I'm going to ask them just to give their reactions. Uh, please. Uh, limit them to just four or five uh, minutes, and then I'll give Commissioner Wilson an opportunity if she has any uh, thing in response she wants to say to respond to you, and, uh, and then that will be it. So I don't know whether you guys have a particular order, but if not, I'll call on Ted first. Okay. Ted, you could do it from right there if okay. you prefer. Okay, will do that. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Randy. It's great to be here. I was a senior fellow at the Free State Foundation working with Randy and Seth until um, a year and a half ago when I ran off to Kansas to start a, another center where we're trying to bring the message of the importance of free markets to uh, Kansas and uh, to college students there as we uh, focus on uh, the same sort of uh, messages uh, there. So it's great to be back here at the, at the Free State Foundation. Um, I started my career in uh, transportation economics, so I enjoyed hearing from uh, Commissioner Wilson on a couple of the topics that we really follow. I'll add one more to the list that's closely related to that, and that is the deregulation of air cargo transportation. A year before, the airline passenger transportation was deregulated. And I think the benefits of that are even greater. We can look out and see uh, Federal Express, see the world's largest uh, air cargo uh, airport in Memphis, uh, where uh, Federal Express is operating, and all the benefits that allow for Amazon, our internet uh, uh, commerce to develop, uh, all the benefits that we never would have anticipated. So you know, I think with, with airline passenger traffic, I think it kind of follows the vision that Alfred Kahn had with the deregulation, but with the air cargo, we couldn't have anticipated uh, most of what happened here. And I think that's true of, of the uh, internet uh, as well, that uh, if, the more it is uh, regulated, the, the more we're likely to lose out on benefits that we couldn't anticipate that we're going to have 10 or 20 years from now. So I do appreciate bringing up those examples. Um, kind of turning to the topic um, of uh, Commissioner Wilson's uh, um, uh, remarks, I am very pleased that jurisdiction is uh, back where it belongs over um, uh, broadband and consumer protection back at the Federal Trade Commission. So back when I was with the Free State Foundation full time, uh, we, uh, Andy and Seth and I wrote a number of pieces saying that the Federal Trade Commission is the agency that is best suited to take that role with its years of expertise, uh, its infrastructure, its you know, dedicated staff. Uh, you know, there's no other agency in the world that really matches that. And with the uh, open internet order that uh, 
the, the shift from uh, Title I regulation to Title II categorization um, really precluded the Federal Trade Commission uh, from this area at a time when the Federal Communications Commission, despite some really outstanding staff there, they just didn't have the infrastructure uh, built up and ready for it. So we actually had a void for a while where we uh, really had, uh, it was very unclear what our, um, what our enforcement was in uh, consumer protection on the internet. So I'm glad it's back with the Federal Trade Commission uh, where it belongs. Uh, the usual objection we got was the ex post versus ex ante uh, during that era that uh, we needed stronger protection that the federal communications could regulate. But you know, I'm also an, an attorney, an antitrust attorney, and I do know that there is tremendous uh, deterrence value for from having uh, even ex post regulation and that uh, uh, companies are well aware of uh, what the enforcement can be and also is a very dynamic industry and uh, you know the, the, the notice and comment rulemaking process is a slow process and which just isn't well suited to a uh, dynamic and rapidly changing um, uh, industry like we see on, on the internet so that's why I'm glad we're back with the Federal Trade Commission where the you know the, the case by case enforcement can proceed and, and is much more adaptable on a, a very fast basis. I also wanted to mention another initiative that the uh, Federal Trade Commission is, uh, has taken on, and that is the new vertical merger guidelines. So back when I was a, an attorney at the Antitrust Division back in 1993, wow, 27 years ago, and uh, that was when uh, the uh, previous vertical merger guidelines were repealed. It seems like a long time ago, and it's also the amount of time we've gone without having vertical merger guidelines. So I'm very pleased that uh, uh, you're pursuing uh, that initiative as well. So Randy and I did some comments on that a couple weeks ago that are up on on the uh, Free State Foundation uh, website that were generally very favorable uh, toward uh, that initiative. So is that a cue okay. to uh, uh, up? All right. Ted, uh, thank you very much. And so now we're going to hear from uh, Tim Brandon. In addition to uh, whatever else I said about Tim earlier, I want to point out, and many of you know this, that he served as chief economist at the Federal Communications Commission uh, during Tom Wheeler's administration. And we're pleased to have you here to, today, Tim. Uh, thanks, Randy, and thanks, Commissioner Wilson, for a great talk. And my bio should include that I'm learning how to play pedal steel. That's the most important thing to me at the moment. Um, let me just make just a few brief comments that will probably necessarily be cryptic because of the time. Um, the, the first point is that I was going to be attending the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis conference next week until it got canceled as so many conferences have been canceled. And as someone from that conference, we're sort of dedicated to the idea that you regulate when the benefits justify the costs, and you get rid of regulations when the benefits no longer justify the cost. End of story. Which means this two-for-one stuff it doesn't quite fit that. And, I've, and so I'm just going to leave that out there to see that you need some, some rationale besides benefit cost analysis to justify that, that kind of policy. Um, the second thing is I, I notice that, that, that net neutrality has managed to claw its way back into the agenda of this meeting yet again. It reminded me of Alexander Petrie's recent column in the Washington Post from the perspective of the 2148 primaries saying that maybe we'll have a woman president by 2152. And I'm wondering whether by the time we have this meeting in 2152, net neutrality may no longer be on the agenda, although, frankly, I'm not too optimistic about that. Uh, so we'll have oscillating regulations. We'll see how many synonyms of openness on one side and freedom on the other side we can get until, uh, until Congress steps in or something. Uh, just very briefly on privacy, something which is one of the points is kind of pedantic is that the problem isn't, isn't exactly asymmetric information. Because if, the inform if you have asymmetric information, markets disappear. The, the problem, uh, you know, just because of the limited time, the problem with these, mar with, with these situations is that I trust you and you're not trustworthy, which in the, for the econ jocks around here, that's not a Nash equilibrium. It, it involves inconsistent expectations and trying to figure out how to rationalize that, explain that, and then use that as a theory to justify damages is, is no mean feat. That's, that's part of the reason why I think it's intellectually complex. And another thing with privacy, what I was thinking about in reading, in, in thinking about this topic because of this event, is whether the problem to be addressed here is that 
I make a privacy promise to you which I don't fulfill, consumer protection problem, or there is some relevant privacy standard everybody should be meeting, some reasonable man sort of negligence type standard. And I'm, the more I think about it, I'm not entirely sure what it is that, that, that we're concerned with here. Um, just two quick points. One on, on vertical mergers, the only thing I'll, I will add about that is that uh, to, to note the distinction that, that Deputy Attorney General Rosen made earlier between the AT&T case and the IBM case, um, one of which was dismissed by Bill Baxter and the other of which the divestor was announced on the same day. And I'm old enough, I was actually in the room on the speakerphone when that news came down. Uh, I was at the Justice Department at the time. The difference was because AT&T was price constrained, regulated in that case, and IBM wasn't. That's a distinction that's gotten forgotten uh, very quickly, and something like that might be worthwhile to include in the merge guidelines since Ted, the vertical merge, propo proposed vertical merger guidelines, which Ted brought up. Finally, um, uh, just on um, Commissioner Wilson's great ex expertise and, and, and the thoughts she expressed today, um, one thing I was looking at some other things is that she has a, a lot of experience, maybe more than almost anybody else has in these kinds of positions, in actually running corporate compliance programs. And one of the big issues these days is structural versus behavioral remedies in any trust. And I, I look forward to the contributions that I'm sure you have made and will continue to make on that, because you know this on the ground a lot better than certainly people like me do. Uh, and the other thing I just had to sort of leave at the end is if you don't want to have private right of action in privacy cases, do you like private right of action in antitrust cases? Tim, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you that were here this morning when I did the introduction, you might recall I made a, a big point, as I do each year, of saying this is the 12th annual Free State Foundation Telecom Policy Conference. Well. Uh, in the context of wondering whether net neutrality would still be around, Tim referred to the year 2152. 20, 2152. Oh, 2152. That was, uh, that was Petrie's column. Okay, yeah. well, if it were 2052, I calculated that would be the 48th annual Free State Foundation uh, Telecom Policy Conference. I'm sure, it'll make, I'm sure it'll make that one. If I'm, well, I was going to say, <laughs> I'm glad you will, but if by some chance I'm not here to do that introduction, I want someone to remember <laughs> remember what was said here today. Okay, with, with that, uh, I want to ask Commissioner Wilson first whether she wants to uh, say anything in response to the, the two uh, academic uh, members, and then we may have time for just a question or two from the audience. Commissioner Wilson. Sure, so I would like to touch on just a couple of the points that Tim made. I agree with Ted, so let me just stick to <laughs> commenting on what, what Tim said. Um, first, the two-for-one uh, deregulatory agenda, I think, is important and can be done in a way that honors the benefit-cost test. At the beginning of the administration, there were various agencies, including DOT, while I was still at Delta Airlines, that said, please tell us about the regulations that you think are outdated and no longer applicable and do not provide any incremental safety for passengers while still imposing a great deal of cost. And the list that we came up with was incredibly long, and there's a docket on that, and you can go and look at that. But I'm not a DOT. Let me stick to what's happening at the FTC. So at the FTC, we have repealed the television picture tube rule. I think the benefits of repealing it outweigh the costs because televisions don't have picture tubes anymore. Second, <laughs> nursery guides, uh, which specifies precisely the kinds of information that m must be provided for every plant that is sold at retail. And uh, there was essentially no one who was in favor of maintaining that rule. Uh, third, energy labeling. We are statutorily required to have an energy labeling rule that, uh, that specifies information that is to be put on appliances regarding energy consumption. And because we are statutorily required to do that, of course we do that, and for the most part the rule is fine, but the rule also specifies the weight of the paper 
on which the energy label is to be printed at 58 pounds per 500 sheets of paper. And it also specifies the minimum adhesive peel capacity <laughs> of the adhesive that is to be used to affix the labels to the appliances. Now, I didn't learn in law school the ideal weight of paper or the ideal adhesive capacity, and so I am quite comfortable urging the commission to replace those provisions in the rule with a reasonableness standard that manufacturers can use uh, to, uh, to, to create their labels. Um, and then, uh, so, so I think we can honor the executive order in a way that also honors benefit costs. I think lots of agencies have lots of rules that are still on the books that are no longer applicable either to market dynamics or because of uh, you know, technological evolutions like the picture tube rule. Um, and then let me talk for just a minute about intervention under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. So uh, you mentioned, Tim, IBM and AT&T. Mm -hmm. There is literature out there that has conducted retrospectives on interventions in the marketplace under Section 2 of the Sherman Act for monopolization or attempted monopolization. And what the literature shows is that, in fact, AT&T is essentially the only successful case where consumers were actually benefited, where prices fell, and where output increased. Almost every single time the government steps in to try to rectify distortions in the marketplace, output actually decreases and prices increase. And so I think we as federal enforcement officials need to be very careful about the ways in which we choose to intervene and where. And then a final note in terms of compliance and behavioral versus structural. Obviously, if you're working on a merger, structural divestitures are, uh, are essentially the gold standard. But I believe that behavioral remedies can work both in a vertical merger space and in uh, other types of business practices. So the airline industry has lots of behavioral remedies that are imposed, information firewalls and that sort of thing. And I have been both at a law firm working on designing compliance programs for airlines and also at the airlines implementing those compliance programs. And I will tell you, they are incredibly effective. Second, in the, in the vertical merger arena, if you have upstream and downstream merging and a behavioral remedy is imposed for a space of time, say five years, that gives the market the opportunity to adjust. If I am a downstream rival who's gonna need a supplier five years hence, I have time to adjust. And so the behavioral remedy protects me for a period of time while I reorganize my supply chain. And so I think behavioral can work and the market will adjust during the pendency of the order. Well, I, I really love this type of back and forth. Thanks, thanks for that, uh, Commissioner Wilson. And I know if we had more time, I suspect that Tim could carry on, and, and maybe we'll just have another program, and we'll pick up right, right here where we're leaving off. But thanks for that. But I do want to, we have a tradition of trying to save some time for questions from the press or the audience here, and uh, to the extent we can, I want to do that today. So we may have time for two questions, but at least one, depending on. It, does anyone have a question? And if anyone there at the press table has one, I'll recognize you first. And if, if not, I'll recognize someone else. And if not, we'll, we'll just... Uh, uh, agree. I, I know I certainly feel this way. It's been a, a wonderful uh, exchange uh, preceded by uh, your remarks, which are greatly appreciated and were certainly very relevant to what we do at the Free State Foundation and I know will be helpful to us in uh, carrying out our work going forward. So join me in thanking uh, Commissioner Wilson and also Ted and uh, Tim, please.